In my last video, I introduced Judith Jarvis Thompson's unconscious violinist analogy. If you haven't heard of this analogy, you should probably watch my video on it, or this one isn't going to make any sense. Some pro-life advocates, including Stephanie Gray, use the concept of extraordinary need to attempt to refute Thompson's analogy. I'm going to briefly describe their view, and then try and refute it. From what I can understand, there are two parts to this view, and the first part goes like this. Parents are responsible for providing for the ordinary needs of their children, like food and shelter and clothing. I'm inclined to agree. The womb provides these things for the child, so women cannot deprive their children of the use of their body during pregnancy, because they would be depriving them of nourishment, and I suppose shelter. Acting as a human dialysis machine, on the other hand, is going above and beyond providing for the ordinary needs of the child, as in, and is indulging their extraordinary needs. Therefore, women are obligated to carry a pregnancy to term, but not donate the use of their kidneys. Now I have one really simple response to refute this part of the extraordinary needs objection, and it is this. Staying plugged into the violinist is not indulging an extraordinary need, it is providing for an ordinary need. To reiterate, acting as a human dialysis machine is providing for an ordinary need, not an extraordinary need. Think about it. The reason why we consider food and shelter and clothing to be ordinary needs and not extraordinary ones like going to Disneyland is because children need those things to survive. If they didn't have food, they would die. If they didn't have shelter, they would die. So it would follow that if a child needed a kidney or blood or bone marrow to survive, that providing them with that would be providing for an ordinary need, not an extraordinary need. Therefore, this argument doesn't refute Thompson's analogy because it fails to provide a reason for why people are obligated to provide food for their children without having to shell out a kidney every now and again. I think a bodily rights argument, on the other hand, can do this. The difference between providing food and bone marrow, for instance, is that bone marrow is part of my body, and I cannot be forced by the government or anyone else to sacrifice my body, although it would be very kind of me to do so. I don't think this view is overly controversial. Consider what the world would be like if parents were legally and morally obligated to provide food for their children with no concern for their own bodily autonomy. Suppose a family was on a plane, and the plane crashed, and everybody else died, leaving only the mother and child, and no food. Would we really say that the mother is legally obligated to saw off her arm and hand it over to their children? Hand it over to their children. I'm so sorry. Anyway, I digress. The point is that bodily rights matter. Now, the pro-life advocates that use this argument will generally counter the claim that being a human dialysis machine is providing for an ordinary need by redefining ordinary needs to mean something along these lines. You are obligated to use the parts of your body for the function those parts were created for, apparently with or without your consent. It therefore follows that since the function of the uterus is to carry a child and a mother would be morally then a mother would be morally obligated to carry the child to term. This view also explains why you would not be obligated to allow the violinist to use your kidneys for nine months, because your kidneys exist in your body to serve your body and nobody else's. Now I have two issues with this objection. The first one is this. By redefining ordinary needs in this way, you are effectively divorcing the needs of the child from the concept of ordinary needs altogether. The function of, of certain body parts really has nothing to do with what children need, or want for that matter. But let's suppose for a, section, for a second that this was in fact a good definition of ordinary needs. It would still be terrible because this definition would obligate women to allow themselves to be raped. How, you ask? Well, the function of the vagina is to allow someone else to enter it for the purposes of procreation. Like the uterus, there are certain things that happen to it biologically that prepare it for this use. Like the uterus, it doesn't seem to have another function besides this one. So if you're going to say that women are obligated to provide their uterus to the fetus because it is fulfilling the purpose of the uterus, then you would have to say that women are obligated to allow themselves to be raped because that would be fulfilling the purpose of the vagina. So this argument fails because it would justify rape, and I hope we can all agree that rape is bad.
If you want to read Stephanie Gray's article that mentions this objection, I have put a link to it in the description of the video. If you like this video, please subscribe and comment. I look forward to hearing from you.